If we wanted to get that water up here, we all know water flows up the money, but there's a lot more money down here pulling that water. So they're looking at that as a potential source is, is just a pipe, no pun intended, pipe dream. So what have we got up here for surface water? We've got Kennedy Gulch, uh, Elk Creek, Deer Creek are up in here, just barely on the edge of our area. We have Deer Creek and we have Turkey Creek and their tributaries that, that come through here. One thing we, need to, we all need to keep in mind is we're sitting up at the headwaters of these little creeks. We all know how much water flows in them. And, and from what we've been able to assess, there's only one use of surface water, and that's the school system. We're entirely dependent on groundwater up here, as you all know. Um, we also are all aware of what's going on with the, the proposed developments, these yellow signs pop up. Uh, notices come through to our, our community groups on things uh, that are coming along. We also know of a couple of uh, high density proposals that have been, uh, are out there uh, being considered and they're in the process of planning and zoning. And so there's, that's part of the, the, the uh, heightened awareness about water is, uh, is there enough water should these things go through. So that's really spawned our uh, trying to do something to, to, to educate people and see if we need to start collecting more data. I'm going to give you just a little background. I'm not going to get drawn into a lot of technical detail. We're going to move into more technical as we move on. What is groundwater? And we don't have underground rivers up here. Groundwater is water that's found in poor spaces of rocks or sediments. And then you can look at it as four basic types. There's well-sorted, unconsolidated sedimentary material, sand and gravel that you can pour out of a bucket. If you put water in there, the water resides in the pore spaces between the grains. You move up one and start to cement those grains together with naturally occurring uh, minerals that, that harden them up and form them into as rock and sandstones. That, that's a consolidated, cemented sedimentary material. This starts to plug off some of those pore spaces, so the amount of water it can hold and the ability to move it between the pore spaces starts to decrease. I'm going to skip down to the fourth, which are uh, pore sp or cavities formed in soluble rocks that then can form. This is the closest you'll ever get to an underground river, but we have nothing like this. These are typically limestones, dolomites. If you've been over to Glenwood and gone through the fairy caves, those caves can carry a lot of water. That's the closest you'll get to having an underground river. We don't have anything like that around here. Then the fourth that we're going to focus on is a fracture. Can you step back and also lower that box? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oops. I don't need to be right there on this. <laughs> so at any rate, with the, what, with the fractured crystalline rocks, the rock itself has no pore spaces in it, uh, essentially, to, to hold or carry water. So you need fractures to, to accomplish any sort of uh, storage or transport of water. Now, where are we up here? Uh, this is a cross-section, to those who are not familiar with how we geologists speak, this would be if you could cut, if you could take a slice of the earth from here out to Lakewood and then look at the side of that cut, that's a cross section. And this is what you would see approximately where 285 goes through the hogback. And so as you go out through there, you cross one of the, one of the most spectacular geological boundaries in Colorado is the Golden uh, Fault Zone. And it separates the Rocky Mountain Uplift from the Denver Basin. And in the Rocky Mountain Uplift, it is brought up along this big fault zone, which is, there's no, there's a little sign that it's active today. This all happened uh, up to about 40 million years ago. This uplift brought up very old crystalline, and by crystalline, I mean it's just tightly grown crystals of different minerals, igneous and metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks have a pattern to them sediments and they were heated and compressed to form the metamorphic rocks. As you head out to the east through the hot backs, you 
you go through the progressively younger sedimentary rocks. And those are sandstones and shales, and there's a little bit of limestone and some evaporites in here. And then you get out into the basin, there, there's a whole pile of marine shales. You keep going further east and you start picking up more sediments. So we're sitting up here in this uplifted block, far from everything that happens out there. So where do, where, how else do we look at, at that in terms of where you might find groundwater? The, the first type that I mentioned, which is uh, unconsolidated sediments, these are in sands and gravels along rivers and streams. We have very little of that kind of material up here on this side of that fault boundary. You have to get out into the plains. And there are some very extensive and deep aquifers full of this kind of material. You can reliably drill wells and pump a lot of water in the industry. How do you get to that water is another matter. And then, moving up to the sedimentary type, these are also out in the plains. These are sedimentary bedrock aquifers up against the uplift. And that's what this bend is meant to show. And this is what the Denver Basin has. And you hear about the big wells that supply Castle Rock and Parker. They're tapping this kind of aquifer out there. Again, we don't have that up here. We're not blessed with that kind of sedimentary uh, setting uh, that we can reliably drill a well into and hit water. Instead, what we have up here are these fractured crystal and bedrock, and uh, Matt Wickham is going to give you a lot more detail than I, I can on that, but what we look for are these fractures that carry water. And you can see this little fracture here is weeping a little bit of water. This is the kind of flow we look for in this type of aquifer. And just to give you another little idea, well, this is what our wells look like. A lot of people come up here, and it may take them years to know what this funny looking thing is out here. And there's a great example back here uh, of what the wells look like. Uh, you know, people don't know what they are until they run out of water and they have to bring in our, our heroes to come and pull a pump and do something with the geo water. And then James Drilling are here as our sponsors. Uh, they, they, these are our lifeblood sitting out there by the edge of your driveway. They are in the back. This is what they might look like in the inside. This is like a cross section. If you drive up the frontage road along I-70, they, when they widened the Mount Vernon Canyon for I-70, they drilled and blasted through this granite and gneiss to widen the road and left us these wonderful examples of what the inside of the well looks like. These are the blast holes. And it's peeled away because of the blasting. So this is what our wells might look like if you could get down there and look. You've got this granite in here. This is like a granite countertop. I mean, if you spill a glass of wine on it, it just puddles, dries out, and becomes a sticky mess. You need these fractures to carry the water. So our wells to drill through here, again, Matt was in much greater detail on that. This is another shot from that same area along the, the frontage road. Gives you an idea. This is about 50 feet, and you can see how much it changes across that panel. So you can understand why you might have a neighbor that pumps 20 gallons a minute and you have to drill 1,000 feet to get a tenth of a gallon. So this is what we, we have up here. This is probably more organized than you might find in most places up here. It's just a great shot of all these whirlpools. So here's what we're going to do today after I'm done here. Uh, Kip the song is going to come up and, and talk to you about the, the water balance and the modeling that he did in the studies back in, 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 around the turn of the century. And John Wallach is going to talk about mountain water use. And then Matt Wickham will talk about the fractured bedrock aquifer. And we'll take a 10 minute break, come visit the uh, sponsors' tables here, get some more snacks, bathrooms. If you go out the doors, take a left, pass where you came in. They're on the left out there with the, the pink and blue columns. Then we'll come back and Roy Laws will talk about the drinking water. He's from the health department. Dean San Stephen is going to talk about the administration of water rights uh, from the state level. And then Heather Grethelis will talk about the planning and zoning. And then we'll take another 10 minute break. We're, we're not going to entertain questions during the talks. We're just going to go from presentation to presentation so it runs smoothly. But we've got cards up there. We're, we're 
we want you to write down any questions you have on these index cards. If you didn't grab them uh, at break, or pick one up and fill them out. We're going to have a, a team that's going to go through them and, and try to sort out uh, how we pass the questions on to our, our panel. And if only if there's time remaining after we've gone through there, we'll be entertained uh, questions, verbal questions from the audience. Uh, I also want to really acknowledge all the help. Neil, Grace, and Mary Ellen have done the lion's share of the footwork, uh, making things happen. We want to thank King Super, thank King Super, Safeway, Geo Water, James Drilling, and Columbia Sanitary. Sanitary, please support them. One last thing, We've, we had a, this has been a real uh, emotional week. Uh, one of our uh, committee members, uh, Mike Fahey, uh, he's, he's brilliant, uh, retired USGS hydrogeologist, uh, expertise in fractured flow. I really admire his passion and dedication to working with us on understanding the groundwater out here. And uh, he was part of the committee and he was scheduled to give uh, the, the middle presentation today. And we found out just Wednesday that he had passed away. Apparently he passed away in his sleep Sunday night. Uh, all we can say is we really appreciate what he did for us. And, uh, in his honor, I brought some Colorado groundwater atlases. We've got a donation jar there. You can donate $10 and get an atlas. Or you can just donate without receiving an atlas. We're going to set up a memorial fund in Mike's name. We haven't quite, this is all so, so sudden. We'll, we'll apply that money either to the scholarships or uh, getting the equipment we need to do water level monitoring. We'll, we'll think about it, but uh, we definitely will miss Mike. So I'm going to turn this over to Kip. And Number, I like to call that number residual. 
If that residual has a positive sign and you measure um, or estimate all the terms in the water balance accurately, you have a pretty good indication that there's some residual water left over. So that's how it works. Um, now, it's important to remember that this residual just applies to the terms that are involved in the water balance. So there's some areas in this diagram here that aren't really addressed by the water balance. And I'll point those out as we go on. Now, around the turn of the century, the USGS conducted a study of the Turkey Creek watershed. As part of that study, water balance terms were studied. Um, I'm really happy that we were able to find an area like the Turkey Creek watershed because it's a nice, discrete system. And most importantly, it has an outflow. And measuring or having knowledge about stream flow is pretty important to what I'm going to talk about today. So that, that's why you know I would never really encourage anybody to try to do something like this for a lot or some general area such as the county. Uh, it works best if you have a nice discrete system. So let's talk a little bit about the hydrologic cycle. Almost all the terms, the big terms in the hydrologic cycle are shown on this diagram. Um, precipitation, of course, is a big input term. It's very important. Uh, stream flow, which consists of three components shown in this diagram, overland flow, base flow, and inner flow, is an output term. Another output term is evapotranspiration. It's a big term. It returns water to the atmosphere. Evaporation uh, occurs from free water surfaces such as streams, lakes, and oceans. And transpira transpiration is a process where plants obtain water via their roots from the soil moisture zone and transport it to their outermost extremities and it's evaporated there. Water that leaves the study area through stream flow is subject to evapotranspiration. And that's the hydrologic cycle. Uh, it's really pretty cool. Uh, on a global scale, the amount of water is pretty much constant. It's just recycled because there are all these different areas. And it's, it's me. <laughs> you know? So um, let's, let's talk about uh, some of these terms here on the diagram. One term that I left out on this diagram that I, I need to mention is, uh, is infiltration. It's not showing, but it's implicit that some precipitation infiltrates the surface and percolates down. Okay. Now, let's talk about these components of flow. Right off the bat, we have overland flow and inner flow. Normally, these two processes take place as a direct result of precipitation. Inner flow is in the subsurface, overflow is like over the surface. I said normally they take place as a direct response to precipitation because snow melt can introduce some, some other circumstances. But these things, both of these things are here and gone pretty quickly. So to my thinking, they're not really important, as important to groundwater flow or groundwater availability as other things. Base flow, however, is important to groundwater availability. Here in the, um, in the foothills, we have what we call a water table setting. People have covered that a little bit. But in a water table setting, um, you know, subsurface water is subject to the forces of gravity. So, some precipitation that infiltrates the land surface percolates downward and eventually gets to a level where all openings are saturated. And that level is called the water table. Um, water, in the below the water table, moves from 
from higher areas to lower areas due to the forces of gravity. When that water intersects a stream channel, it contributes flow to the stream, and that flow is called phase flow. Now it's important, well, first let me say, in Turkey Creek, we pretty much have base flow all year round. Turkey Creek has never gone dry in my knowledge, so we have base flow all year and that, that is a good thing. That is a good thing. Now, because the water that supports this base flow is available to wells. And I need to qualify that a little bit. When I say it's available to wells, I should really say it's theoretically available to wells. The hydraulics of the matrix that contains the water, which is the aquifer, is fractured. And the hydraulics may make it pretty complicated for the wells to actually extract that water. So it's a good index for how much water might be available, but the total water might not be available. Now, there's also a term on here called underflow. And I hope that when you look at this diagram, you get the picture of the feeling that underflow is a little bit deeper. Um, the level for the base of streams is sometimes referred to as base level. And if the water table falls below base level, which is the same thing as saying that you know, the water table is simply lower than the stream channels, there won't be any base flow. But there will still be water in the system. And it's this water associated with what we're calling underflow. Now, <coughs> although this water is moving very slowly, it is moving. And that's why it's referred to as underflow. Okay. Now, I can't tell you how deep this system goes. I can't tell you what the hydraulic characteristics of this system is. But I can tell you that it's important. <laughs> and we'll see a little bit about how it's important. OK. Uh, we're going to look at another diagram now. <clears throat> And this diagram is very similar to what we were just looking at, but it's a little more detailed. It sort of brings the, uh, the role of fractures in the play. And I'm not going to talk much about fractures. I'm just going to talk about fractures. Um, I am going to just take a minute to say that I'm sorry that Mike's not here to talk about this. You know, these kind of issues have been discussed up here for decades, and Mike has always been involved in those discussions. And uh, and very motivated, and I was looking forward to hearing what he's going to have to say. So rest in peace, Mike. And what I will say, and just moving on, what I want to say that's interesting about this figure here, it's different than the other one, is it's got numbers on it. <laughs> okay? So uh, I'm going to focus in on one of those numbers, and it's the one link to groundwater sink. We'll talk about that a little bit. But before we do, I think it's important to uh, talk about where these numbers came from. <clears throat> well, they came from a precipitation <coughs> one on model. As part of this USGS study, we collected uh, data that would run the model, and that's precipitation and temperature. And we calibrated the model for data collected during the study, which is just under three years. And when we got done, we said, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we run this model for a much longer period of time and expose it and find out things about variations in the climatic influence. So we found like a little bit over a 50 year period of record uh, in Bailey. Now um, using data from Bailey is not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. Okay? So the output for the model it's very comprehensive, and I'm not going to talk about a lot of the output from the model. I'm just going to talk about two terms. But I'll tell you, there's an awfully lot of results from the model in the report that we produced after doing this project. And at the end of the presentation, I'll give you some. Uh, I'll give you a search term that will allow you to find the report very easily. 
and you can go through the very unenjoyable process of printing it out if you want to. But anyway, um, the first uh, term that I want to focus on that came out of the model is uh, the model would tell us how much water is associated with supporting this base flow. Okay? And the model would also, also tell us how much water percolates down to the water table and is not required to support base flow. So these two terms together are a representation of the incoming water that's available to wells. So that's basically the annual recharge of the water table that's available to wells. Now, um, this second number, groundwater uh, sink, is, is um, it has a value of 0.4 in this diagram. And that's the central tendency of the mean of the long-term simulations. If we add in the contents of the base flow reservoir, we're looking at uh, about 0.7 inches. So that's a depth of water <laughs> uh, of 0.7 inches over the entire surface of the Turkey Creek watershed. That's a, a little bit over 1,500 acres. Now, if you look at that number through the 50-year simulation, you'll find that sometimes it's increased by a factor of two, and sometimes it's decreased. By a so a little over a quarter of an acre is an uh, Now what's really interesting, when this really gets interesting is if we compare it to uh, my calculation of how much water is withdrawn by households in the Turkey Creek watershed. And if you do that, it's almost uncanny you come up with a number that's very comparable to 0.7 inches. Uh, but because we know that 0.7 is sometimes as little as 10% of that, that sort of implies that the water in this uh, underflow zone is a player. We need to learn about this underflow zone. And this is pretty much the domain, not of precipitation runoff modeling, it's the domain of water, of groundwater. So I'm going to close by saying I haven't really talked about the total amount of water that's available, but I have, we have pretty much described an estimate for the amount of water that's added to the total amount annually. And that's a good start. You know, so that's about as far as I can go. Uh, my name is on the handout along with my email. You can contact me. I'll send you a copy of this uh, document. I'm kind of going right over. And if you're interested in finding the report, the search term you can type in is it's pretty simple. It's uh, USGS space WRIR space 03 hyphen 4034. That'll take you to a website where you can download the whole So that's it. I didn't do too bad. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, all these services are in an area that we call the conifer activity area. And my question uh, that I started off with was, you know, how, how much water are we using? Where are we getting our water in the village area? Do we have any issues? Because a lot of new proposals come in with high density uh, proposals uh, that use a lot of water. So there's a, a system available from Jefferson County planning and zoning called JMAP. And I have a link for this in the last slide. And you can pull up this map and display a number of different layers just, just to look at some data and uh, try and uh, analyze whatever you're after there. Uh, Conifer is almost entirely well based. As Peter pointed out, I discovered this past week that our schools, the uh, middle school, high school, and elementary, actually uh, have processed water from the uh, North Turkey Creek uh, surface water. And that's the one exception that <clears throat> we know of. The rest of the uh, community is based on wells. So how much water are we using, and where, is it, uh, where does it come from? So I've turned on all the um, the layers for the different types of wells. Sorry. Uh, there's four basic types: the uh, commercial, uh, domestic, household, and municipal. And within the activity center, right up here along 285, there's 363 total wells. And there's different factors you can use. These are all metered, of course. So you can use factors to estimate the uh, consumption. The table, the table here shows the allowable uh, water for those different well types. And it gives us a consumption here, or water production, or use of uh, about 190,000 gallons per day. And I'm using gallons per day for this uh, because gallons per day are used in the well uh, permits. They talk gallons per day in proposals for developments. So rather than talk acre feet, uh, we're talking gallons per day. And so 190,000 if everybody was at the max. If people used an average of say 240 gallons per day, this figure, total figure, would be 86,000 gallons per day. So that's all the individual wells within Conifer Activity Center. Uh, we also have, within the Activity Center, three uh, municipal, or I should say centralized water supplies. These th uh, the three include uh, Aspen Park Metro District. Up here, that's the old, uh, that's King Supers. Conifer Metro District is the new Safeway, and uh, the old Safeway area, that uh, commercial area, is called CSA, Conifer Sanitation Association. All of these uh, centralized systems are metered, and uh, the Jefferson County uh, Environmental Engineer Roy Laws, who will also be presenting uh, today, uh, provided me with uh, about 100 spreadsheets of well pumping data, and uh, I pursued the <laughs> trying to summarize these into a single sheet so that you can get an understanding of the whole uh, uh, activity center. And these are the, the three systems. Right here we have in green Aspen Park Metro District. The center, uh, 8,000 gallons per day, is the old Safeway area, CSA, and the magenta. 14,000 gallons per day is the new Safeway or Conifer Metro District. So three centralized systems. The oldest one is the center one, <clears throat> the old Safeway, and they were established before we had a uh, recharge requirement. Recharge means that the, the centralized system uh, is asked to put back, recharge the groundwater in roughly the same place that they pump the water from because it's a concentrated uh, draw off the groundwater. And uh, 
the performance here for the new Conifer uh, Metro District so far has been running about uh, 87 percent. So fairly close to the 90 percent recharge. And they do this with, instead of a septic system, they have an exfiltration gallery, uh, which is uh, a means of pump, uh, getting the water back into the ground. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. releases their water to surface. They didn't have that recharge requirement. And that water goes into the North Turkey Creek. And the green is Aspen Park Metro District. And their water, uh, they had some difficulty about eight or 10 years ago at where their exfiltration gallery couldn't keep up. They expanded it. It was designed for 25,000 gallons per day. Their demand went up. <clears throat> And uh, after expanding it, they still had some difficulties, so they had a decree to release to Salt Turkey Creek. And so that's what's been going on since 2013. Uh, their average, if you look over the past, uh, the data on this screen is 82%. And if you look at just the last five years since they've been uh, releasing the surface, they've been uh, running about 60 4%, 63% recharge. And the rest goes into South Turkey Creek. Uh, the return to surface numbers here, the bottom uh, group there, the dark color, CSA. The magenta color is the release to surface uh, for the um, Aspen Park Metro District. And I guess the, the takeaway from this chart is that uh, on this sheet here, there's about 25 million gallons, and the trend is going up. I don't know if, if there's so many variables, but you wonder if the exfiltration gallery has uh, uneven performance or whatever. But that's, that's where we stand right now as a community in terms of uh, consumption and, and recharge. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> There's a link, uh, there are links in the uh, last sheet of this uh, presentation for uh, JMAPS. Uh, Department of Water Resources also has a map function that you can look at all wells. And uh, there's some of the papers on water studies down here. So, thank you. Thank you, John. Density, orientation, and aperture. 
Uh, in some of these deposits, we've got uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometers of log core uh, with information about the, uh, the fracture systems. We do surface geophysics. We do downhole geophysics. We use things called you know, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging to try to understand where the fractures are and how open they are, potentially how conductive they are. We'll pump between different wells uh, and try to look at the hydraulic responses to tease out the hydrogeologic behavior in these fractured flow systems. We'll inject tracers and try to pull them to another well so we can understand how solutes move through these systems. Uh, we develop these uh, very expensive and sophisticated numerical groundwater flow models to try to represent these fractured type flow systems. And some of them are uh, based on statistical distribution, so hypothetical distributions based on all these other measurements that we've made. Uh, to try to understand the probability of, of a particular outcome. So how a well might, might affect groundwater inflow into a pit, those types of things. So we have huge resources that we put into understanding fracture flow, and we have to, not just for, for safety, but the engineers need to know how big the pipeline has to be to convey this water that we're pumping out. The water treatment guys need to know how big the water treatment plant has to be in order to accommodate this water and how much sludge they might be generating and where that has to go. With, with all that said, at the end of the day, for fracture flow systems, because of their complexity, we wind up making generalizations about how those systems behave. We make simplifying assumptions. We have to because the behavior of these systems is sometimes unknowable. Uh, and with that said, uh, what I've, what, I, what I've tried to do here is uh, to put together some generalizations about, um, about fracture flow, maybe a little bit of information about the characteristics of fracture flow, uh, but then provide something that I think would be useful rather than going into a bunch of pointy-headed discussions about numerical modeling and all of that. What is it that, that well owners like myself would like to know uh, about their wells uh, that's that's, that's informed by understanding fracture flow. So I'll talk about basic characteristics, then I'll talk about considerations for well siting, so where you would put a well, a little bit about considerations for well construction and development, and then a little bit about contaminant fake transport. So contaminant fake transport would be where you have contaminants moving into the system, and how they move through the system, and what happens to them. Fake means what happens to them. Do they biodegrade, um, do they volatilize? those types of things. Peter talked a little bit about this. So we've got different types of aquifers. This is classification of porous and fractured rocks. Pretty much what we have here is on the upper right uh, and, and the lower right here. So we can have heterogeneous porous media. That would be something like a sandstone um, that maybe is variable, has variable properties uh, with, within its occurrence. Then we've got this, this D and E here. D would be where we have, um, we have some water that's held up in the unfractured rock, but it doesn't move very much. And then we've got most of the water moving through the fracture system here. And then the purely fractured media is probably closest to what we have in, 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 in most of our properties up here. We've got these more or less impermeable <coughs> blocks um, of, of, uh, of granite and, and metamorphosed materials, and then we've got almost all of our flow through these fracture planes, these fracture sets. So these are complex systems. They're heterogeneous, which means that their properties vary in space. And they're uh, anisotropic. Um, anisotropic just means that there's a directionality to how water flows through these systems. So for example, let's say you have all of your fractures oriented this way, but the slope of the water table is this way, the water is going to want to flow that way. That's, um, that, that's kind of what I'm getting at there. They're difficult to characterize and to predict those conditions. Um, the flow occurs largely in the fractures, at least up here. Uh, we don't have a lot of flow through, uh, through the unfractured material itself, so we consider it to be largely impermeable. And then the fracturing itself is, is very site specific. It's uh, ge uh, structurally controlled, so um, which is sort of a larger scale process geologically. 
And then site-specific processes which affect things like weathering um, of, of those materials. There's a number of factors with regard to fracture flow that are important in terms of how much water you can pull out of it. Um, and these are just three of them. There's fracture connectivity. You can have a highly fractured system, but if the fractures aren't connected, water's not going to move through that. You can have uh, a lot of fracturing, but if there's no space between the fractures, so the fracture aperture is very, very small, then it doesn't hold much water, and it's not going to convey very much water. And then you can have fracture uh, spacing. So you can have a couple of good fractures out there, but if you don't have enough of them, they're just not going to have a lot of water that's available. And obviously, these are all connected. Um, if you have very low fracture spacing, um, then the, the odds that you have good fracture connectivity is, is reduced. So ideally, you have all three of those, and then you have sort of a sweet spot in the middle there uh, where you can expect to have um, good productivity. So there's a huge difference in terms of how much water is present and how much water you can extract from, say, a porous granular uh, aquifer versus a, a fractured system. So for like a well-sorted sand or gravel type aquifer, you can have a drainable amount of water. So if you somehow could open up the bottom of that box, the amount of water that would flow out would be somewhere in the order of 10 to 30% of the total volume of that box. That's what you get from these, uh, these unconsolidated alluvial and colluvial aquifers. For a fraction type system, um, depending on the, the system itself, you can get a drain of porosity that's usually less than about 1%. It means there's just not a lot of water that's held there. Um, and this graphic here on the, on the left sort of shows that. So for a five gallon bucket, sand and gravel, you can get about 16 cups of water but with some assumptions for an equivalent amount of fractured rock, you can get about three teaspoons of water. Pretty, pretty significant difference. So that's one of the challenges we face under as, as, as water well owners. So in these fractured type systems, these, these metamorphic and, and, and igneous um, plutonic systems, uh, what kind of well, well units can we expect from these fraction systems. Um, this upper study is from Davis and Dewey's, uh, and this was a, a large um, study that was done on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada in the same type of geologic setting. And you can see that, that this is gallons per minute. If you can't read that, most of the wells are producing something less than about 10, 15 gallons per minute. Most of them are, are commonly around, around five or so. This is from the Turkey Creek watersheds, and these are uh, a statistical analysis of the reported well yields. Uh, these are the diff different types of formations we have up here. Generally, we're looking at an average of around five to eight or so gallons per minute. So that's what you can expect to get from a, well, a properly constructed and maintained well up here. Now, some people are lucky, and they can get up you know, to, to tens of, of gallons per minute, but that's fairly uncommon. Uh, one thing I'll point out before I move on is that these fault zones tend to have higher permeability, they have higher fracture densities, they have higher drainable porosities. And that's just because at faults you've got a lot of geologic movement and you can tend to bust up the rock around them. So you can get, you, know, you can typically get more flow in those areas, plus a lot of the fault zones tend to be weaker zones, so they eroded over geologic time, so they tend to be at the bottoms of the valleys where most of the water is, is trying to flow anyway. So, is that enough water, five gallons per minute? Um, well, yeah, it kind of depends on uh, how much you need the water for. Most of us are residential or domestic uses. So Jeffco uses about 300 gallons per day. Um, you know, the feds estimate daily human consumption to be about you know, 50 gallons per person per day, uh, if you're conservation-minded, uh, or up to 100 to 200 gallons per day, uh, if you're not conservation-minded. So if you have a well that produces 0.1 gallons per minute, and that's a sustainable flow rate, not an instantaneous flow rate, you can expect about 150 gallons per day, which is not a lot of water. One of our neighbors up the hill behind us they had a 900 foot well that made 0.1 gallons per minute. And so they were told to put in a bunch of cisterns. Well, unless they travel a lot, they're never going to fill them up. So 
they put in a second 900 foot well and they got another 0.1 gallons per minute. So uh, you really have to sort of adjust your livestock to, to meet your, uh, uh, how much water you can produce. Get up to one gallon per minute, that's 1,440 gallons per minute, and so on and so forth, and you'll have to factor in your own pets, recreational water needs. So wh where would you want to put a well up here uh, in, in these fraction bedrock aquifers? There's a lot of exceptions to this, but what I've tried to do here is boil down my observations into something that's useful for, for well owners. So this would be for where you put your well on your property. Uh, topographic conditions are important. Um, if you put your well up on top of a ridge line, you may not have an option to do otherwise, but the ridge is there because it's resistant to erosion, which means it's probably not weathering, which means it's probably not a very good potential source uh, of groundwater at that location. Plus, if you're up on a ridge line, the depth to water would be greater. Um, plus, if you're on a ridge line, you probably don't have a hydrogeologic watershed above you because you're sitting on top of the world there. So, this is a study also from Davis and DeWeese. Uh, this shows the percentage of wells uh, with a yield equal to or, uh, or, or excess of, of, of these, these levels here. This line here shows as sort of a cumulative distribution uh, wells at or near the crest of the hills. So you can expect to get generally lower yields on the, on the ridge, ridge tops, and then the yields can be expected to increase as you move further down the, into the bottoms of the drainages. And that's because you've got more water, uh, more watershed above you, plus those drainages, at least up here, are typically associated with the geologic structure. Where you can have weakened rock or weathered rock. Uh, another would be faulted and weathered areas. The, uh, the Turkey Creek study shows that the uh, well yields are typically higher where you have faulting. And if you look in that report, it actually shows you a map of where these big fault zones are up here in the, in the Turkey Creek watershed. Weather areas, uh, typically if you have a drainage, um, those drainages occur because there's weathering that's occurring in that area. So those are good targets. You don't want to be next to other people's wells. Um, they're going to interfere with each other. You're going to be trying to pull the same, you could be trying to pull from the same aquifer. Um, so they're going to interfere with each other. Proximity to recharge areas. Um, recharge areas would be drainages, they could be ponds, they could be rivers or creeks. Uh, the closer you are to those, uh, the, the more access to recharge you might have through those fracture networks. The size of the upgrading watershed um, is, is pretty self-explanatory. And then sort of an obvious one, distance to contaminant sources. And the contaminant sources up here would be things like leach fields. Uh, it would be uh, livestock, industrial activities, those types of things. You want to maximize that distance. Considerations for well construction. Um, just a couple of things to point out. So the effect of weathering processes and fracture density rule of thumb in, 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 uh, in fractures on hydrogeology uh, for obvious reasons. Um, the fracture apertures tend to decrease with depth as well because you've got more rock sitting on top. You've got more lithostatic pressure forcing those fractures together. Uh, so drilling deeper isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, but there is value in doing it. Um, with these long completions, so the screen interval that you have longer that is, it increases your odds of actually hitting some of these deeper fractured sets. Um, so it increases, uh, it increases your chances of, um, of actually being able to produce more water, recognizing that those odds decrease the deeper you go. Um, it also you know, it gives you more breathing room if the water tables are fluctuating because of drought long-term climate change uh, or other, other factors. And then you can also use the well uh, to, for in-well water storage. So you've got all of the storage sitting here that can reduce your above ground or exit to storage requirements. So fracking. Um, so it has a, um, uh, some negative connotations uh, primarily associated with oil and gas, but people have been water well fracking since the 60s and 70s. Um, it, there's some, some important differences. 
Um, it's primarily a well cleaning method, uh, where you want to clean out the, some of the sediments and whatnot that have accumulated in the fracture sets uh, during drilling or, or well construction. In oil and gas, you're dealing with much, much deeper depths. Um, and there you've got significantly higher lithostatic pressures, so they have to use much, much higher pressures. So they're talking about, you know, there they're using pressures of uh, 20,000 to 100,000 pounds per square inch uh, to try to jack open these, uh, these fractures. For water well, we're using, you know, maybe 2,000 to 6,000 PSI. Probably some of your pressure washers get up that high. Um, the, uh, the oil and gas industry, they're not drilling into, you know, they're not fracking into aquifers, they're fracking into uh, uh, oil reserves. They're using a, a, you know, sort of a dog's breakfast of, of different types of chemicals to help facilitate their fracking. Uh, that's not used in water oil industries. So you typically have to use um, potable water, it's generally disinfected. Um, so it, it's, uh, we're definitely dealing with much shallower depths here. There's just three things I'll talk about briefly. There's three different methods that are commonly used in open boreholes during construction. So one of them is uh, called jack and flush. Jack means you just jack open the fractures. And then you flush out all the, the stuff that's accumulated in there. Uh, you can jack and prop, which means you do the jacking, but you also put sand into it. So you put the sand into the fractures to hold them open. Uh, and then fracture and prop. This requires extremely high pressures. It's pretty uncommon in, in a water well, unless you're looking at large uh, uh, industrial wells. Uh, a little bit about fracture flow theory. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, this should actually be a one, I'm sorry. That's, that's a <laughs> uh, just a quick point here. I have to have an equation in every presentation. But um, because the porosity in these fracture systems is so low, it means that the velocity through those fractures can be extremely high. And that means that we all need to be aware of the potential for contaminants to move fairly rapidly through fractured rock systems. Um, so the, when you pump from a well in a fractured system, you can draw water in from large distances through those fractures. The contaminant velocities can move pretty high. As I mentioned before, the direction of flow may not necessarily be um, you know, down slope because of fracture orientations. And because there's not a lot of reactive surface area in these fractured systems, there's not a lot of attenuation capacity for, for contaminants. So what do we need to do here? Well, we need to observe and enforce these setback rules. We need to maintain our septic systems and our leach fields. We need to test our water often for organics, inorganics, as well as uh, bacteria disinfect your well periodically, that's just good housekeeping. Or also, when we all live in this watershed, we're all responsible for it. We need to police it, not just our own activities, but um, to the extent that we can, our neighbors. And we need to self-regulate and take responsibility. We've got to be the eyes and the ears for these watersheds. Uh, you know, be responsible in terms of wastewater and hazardous waste disposal. Uh, livestock management practices are important as well. And industrial activities, I mean, if you see your neighbor burying his dead horse above your water well or degreasing his skid steer or those types of things, uh, maybe not on his door. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Now it's time for a break. Uh, please stand up. Visit our uh, sponsors that Matt recommended there. These are the guys we talked to you about many of those uh, activities. Uh, and then if you're filling out questions, there's a little box on the table where you sign in, you can put the cards in there so we can go to the Thank you. All the way up here, uh, we have got representatives from the county, Lord Laws, and Heather Guthrie-Lewis. Well, they're taking a, you know, a, a weekend to come up and, and present to us. We really want to show our appreciation that they would do do that for us, and the county's also been showing a lot of willingness and eagerness to work with us on these water issues. I'd also like to express gratitude to uh, Dean Stan Stephen and uh, Tim Buckley for coming here on their day off. Uh, Dean had to drive all the way here from Wellington area. Uh, he's with the state engineer's office in New York. So we really got to appreciate these people doing this for us, and it's important for us to hear from them.
them, and I think it's also good for them to let us know what they have to do. Our next speaker is Roy Laws with the Health Department. Uh, really appreciate his being able to speak to us today for many reasons. He can explain what I mean by that if he wants, but he doesn't have to. All right, All right. Hey, Roy. thank you very much. Well, I do feel very fortunate to be here today. Uh, you know, I work for Jefferson County, and so I want to thank each and every one of you for my paycheck. And all the taxpayers, uh, you all uh, uh, support me in my efforts. So it is uh, great to be up here and to provide, uh, be part of the community and, and share some uh, some information that I have. I did, uh, as, as the other presenters were going up, up they, they certainly laid the groundwork for a lot of the things I want to talk about. Uh, came to the ground floor model that mentioned inputs and outputs. And you'll be seeing one of my slides that uh, talks about some inputs and outputs. Um, another thing that uh, came up, and, and actually uh, Matt did a super job, uh, and even though we didn't talk to each other, uh, of bringing up two of the points that I'm really going to talk about, and the takeaway messages that I want you to have is take care of your, uh, your septic system, uh, because it's a very important component of cleaning up the water before it returns to the groundwater system. And test your well annually. The reason why you have to do that is things can change over time. Even though you've had a good test result year after year, um, not so much that the geologic conditions that can change, but dolphin can come up and other things can change. So you want to test your well annually. It can be done fairly inexpensively. And then when you have the data, then you have the ability, the knowledge to do something about it if there are contaminants of concern. So take care of your septic system because it is a key component of uh, returning the water that we use to the groundwater system and also test your well once a year. And I want to just call out one more thing. Um, we, Jefferson County, is embarking on an initiative to, uh, to get a lot of well information, a lot of well data. We have some money available, and we're going to be offering free well testing. So if you have a well and you have a history of uh, some contaminants and you've had to treat your wells, we really would like the opportunity to provide you some uh, free water quality testing. Um, now, not every well is eligible. We're certainly looking for wells that are in critical areas, but uh, there's, I'll have my contact information up here. I didn't bring my uh, my uh, business cards I wish I had because I do want you to get in touch with me and uh, if you're interested in having your well tested because we really do need that data. Over and over again during these presentations, you've heard that now the more data that we can get, the more we can learn about this complex system and start to take the actions and, and request some of the policies and uh, treatment systems in place that are going to uh, help do a better job with our, our water treatment and help maintain the quality of the water. So just those are my, my three main takeaways. Take care of your septic system, test your well annually, and consider uh, giving me a call so that we can see if you're eligible for our, our water quality sampling program. Now, on the brochure that went out, it actually said drinking water from private wells and wastewater treatment systems. So you can read that and you can say, okay, drinking water from private wells and drinking water from wastewater treatment systems. <laughs> you know, eventually the technology will get there, but we're not quite there yet. But actually, on the spaceship, the space station, they recycle all of their water. So there are technologies available to go directly from toilet to tap. So but those are pretty expensive systems. Not, not trying to promote those just yet. So my main contact information, again, I've had the pleasure of working for Jefferson County for uh, Health Department for 20 years now in the Environmental Health Services Division. Telephone number and email address. Photo oh, leader. Excuse me? Oh, uh, sure. It's on here. And yeah, like I said, I forgot my business cards. And it's on that uh, reference sheet up there, too. So a couple of sources. So. And then you come see me afterward when we're uh, or when we're on break. So a little bit about background, naturally occurring water conditions, sources of contamination. Primarily, that's human beings, but there are naturally occurring contaminants as well. 
uh, treatment requirements, you know, what, uh, what uh, drinking water standards are and, and what uh, levels we want to treat the water to so that we know it's safe for our health, treatment options that are available, and then we'll also talk uh, some about the wastewater treatment systems. So water, we all want to have good, clean water to drink. Uh, fortunately, in the mountain environments, uh, generally speaking, the water is of pretty good quality. But there can be some naturally occurring and human, human uh, caused contaminants. So we definitely want to have water to drink. And I'm, I'm glad to see the snow out there. Now, we don't want slippery roads, but that's what's going to recharge our groundwater system. So yeah, that, that snow out there is a good and welcome sight to see. It also means that it's not 80 degrees in, in November either. So that, that's a good thing, too. So why Cassie Wells? Well, it's a private water system. No one else is going to test it for you. And until you test it, you don't know what's in your water. But once you know what's in your water, knowledge is power, then you can take steps to treat the water if there are some contaminants of concern. Water well quality, it's, this is so tied to the geology and the nature of, of water as it moves through the system. So that's what's going to pick up a lot of the natural contaminants that we talk about. Locally, there can be odor and taste issues in your water, hardness or corrosivity of the water. There can be a naturally occurring radioactivity in your water, and uranium and uh, other metals can be dissolved in, in, in your water supply. And as I mentioned before, the problems aren't widespread, but they do occur, and, and you need to know about it so you can take steps to uh, address those issues. Our basic, this is the basic things that we recommend testing for annually, at least the bacteria and nitrates, two of the important things. Fluoride would be one of those naturally occurring things that would come from uh, mineral deposits in the, in the geology. If you live in certain areas, if you live near a mining uh, 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 operation, that can, uh, first of all, it indicates the reason that they're there mining is because there's a mineral deposit. And if there's a mineral deposit there, well then those minerals can be released into the, into the water. So certain areas that you live in, you live near an industrialized area, or there's a gas station or something like that, or a lot of agricultural or, or commercial activities or industrial activities going on, those could be sources of pollutants. Fortunately, the mountains were pretty remote and isolated. Um, uh, testing resources. There's a lot of private labs that will do your testing for you, but what you want to make sure of is that you've got an EPA, is there a pointer here? Oh, that there's a certified lab. So there's a lot of water quality labs out there, but you want to definitely look for a certified lab. And also the state health department is a great place to go to get your water testing. Uh, you can talk to them about what water tests are available, and then they'll send you the sample bottles free of charge. And then uh, they'll also provide the instructions on how to collect a good sample from your water supply. Then with the, with the analysis, you want to pay for the, the, prep, the fee for the, the uh, analysis. And then they can also provide explanation of what, you know, how to interpret those analytical results, as we can too at Jefferson County Public Health. So if you do find some contaminants of concern, the good news is there's, there's many different treatment technologies are, that are available. Some are fairly inexpensive, but they can get to be pretty expensive if you've got water that has a lot of issues, in it, highly corrosive water, um, or that sort of thing. So there are technologies that are available. This is an example of a small system. This is what's called a reverse osmosis system. Does, by any chance, does anybody have a reverse osmosis system? So we're looking at, eh, looks like there's about a half a dozen or so folks that do. And I also would like to ask, how many folks are on a private well? Everybody here? Okay. Uh, keep your hands up. Uh, uh, if you have a, a well that's uh, less than 100 feet deep, put your hand down. Okay. Less than 300 feet. How about 500 feet? Anybody with a 1,000 foot well? Okay. Now there, there's one. A couple of them out there. So they, again, they talk about that variability of the geology and these fracture systems. So, um, I just, you know, it looks like just about everybody's on a well here. So this is what you can consider. A reverse osmosis system It's called a point of use, so it's just going to be at your kitchen sink. It's not going to treat all the water in the house. Or a bathroom, you know, wherever you're going to get drinking water or, or water that you can use in food prep preparation. And I think the cost of those is roughly $1,500 plus or minus, depending on 
uh, other, if there's any other issues that you need to treat in your water. All these systems need to be maintained. So it's not once and done. You need to maintain your system and probably change out some of the cartridges from time to time. References, I, did, well, I do have some of these handouts on the back table. So once you do have your water tested, or again, the importance of testing the water, have your water tested, what are the contaminants that you're looking at, and what are the treatment options that are available to you. A couple of others of interest would be on the well construction. Again, to get a little bit more familiar with it, your well, how it operates, and how to, how to make sure you, you maintain the integrity of the well so that you get a long term performance. And also septic system uh, maintenance. A couple of the brochures that we have. Lots of references available. And, uh, our presentations will be available. One of the references I do want to point out to you is this uh, website here at Montana State. They have, I'll say, a dozen different videos that cover everything from sampling your well, to shock chlorinating your well, to care and feeding of your septic system, a variety of topics that, again, a, a private home, homeowner who's working with on a well and septic system would like to, like to know. Short, they're, they're probably run from 10 to 15 minutes long, and they do a great job of explaining a lot of these issues that we encounter. So now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about on-site wastewater treatment systems. And I didn't call it a septic system. And what we used to call them is sewage disposal. Because all we used to care about is, I got sewage. I don't want it here. I want to dispose of it someplace else. I don't want to see it. I want to flush the toilet, and I want it to go away. So septic systems, sewage disposal systems, and our our regulations used to be called individual sewage disposal systems, because that's what's it. We just wanted to get rid of it. Well, today we call them on-site wastewater treatment systems, and that's the key word there. We do need and we want these systems to treat the water, treat the wastewater, before it's returned to the environment. So if we take a look at a, a typical system, we're going to start with our well. This is our water supply. Without water, we don't make wastewater. So you got to have an input, water, coming into the house. We use it for a variety of reasons. Drinking, cooking, cleaning, um, washing laundry, uh, probably a dozen or so uh, things that we use it for. Then the wastewater that we put to our use and our benefit is going to go through our sewer pipe and come into the first component, which is the septic tank. And then it's going to flow from the septic tank out to a, a dispersal system, a soil treatment area, or drain field or leach field. A lot of different terms for it. Today we call it soil treatment area because we want treatment. We want to treat that water before it percolates through the ground and back maybe into the fracture system and into our, uh, to, to return to the water supply. So, yep, we want to get treatment out of these systems little illustration of uh, the Turkey Creek Basin, right, 47 square miles. All these dots represent septic systems, okay, on-site wastewater treatment systems. So we've got um, probably close to 5,000 on-site wastewater treatment systems in, in the basin, and almost the same number of wells. Of course, down here is where Aspen Park is in Confer area. And there are some uh, areas that don't depend on uh, private wells. Certainly Indian Hills has a water treatment system in place. Um, and there's a few others that have a public water system that provides well. But most folks uh, in, in the Turkey Creek Basin do depend on, on a private well as their water supply. <clears throat> so what's in domestic wastewater? Well, I, I just mostly it's water. You know, that, that just added a few, you know, as we cleaned up things and, and took care of things, mostly water, probably even closer to 98% water, and about 5% other stuff. Well, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about what that other stuff is. And so I said, it's like, well, I'm going to make a list of these things. And interestingly enough, so many of these things start with the letter P. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody thinks P, puke, not often, but every once in a while, may, may vomit. Of course, there are usually going to be pathogens in vomit. Pulverized produce from a garbage disposal. Personal care products, soap, shampoos, deodorants, all these things that we use in the house. Pharmaceuticals, taking medicines, they can uh, end up down the drain. Our vitamins, not everything gets uh, 
uh, metabolizing through our body, some of them ends up in the wastewater stream and, and paper. So inputs, these are the things here that make my doctor happy, and these are the things that make me happy. <laughs> so I enter into this, uh, this food pro primary food processing unit, a human being. And along the path, they get digested and, we, and it energizes our body. But every once in a while, I can pick up some pathogens, things like norovirus. You ever had norovirus? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what? The thing about norovirus is your body doesn't really like it in there. And it's going to try to get rid of it through any opening it can find. <laughs> so you're usually going to have a, a severe case of vomiting and diarrhea when you get a norovirus in Good thing is it passes pretty quick. So. Outputs. So now again, these are some of the, we talked about the inputs, and here's some outputs. Stuff that's going to be entering into our, uh, into our, our wastewater. So we come back to our on-site wastewater treatment system, and this, this picture is, of course, missing the well. We've got to have our source of water. And again, we're going to get treatment in the septic tank. That's our pre-treatment. Then it's going to flow out into our soil treatment area where it's going to infiltrate in the unsaturated zone, and there's going to be a lot of other processes that take place to help purify the water before it returns to groundwater recharge. So very important component. And what we find out is for every gallon, well, I'll go with this, for every 100 gallons that we pump out of the ground to use indoors, we lose about 10%, about 10 gallons, but 90% is going to return to this hydrogeologic cycle and get back in, enter into the groundwater system. So again, critical that we take care of this on-site wastewater treatment system so that we're putting decent water back into our, into our environment. Components, yep, the septic tank that we talked about. Waste, this is the first component. Uh, so the wastewater comes out of our house and it's going to come into the septic tank. Now, septic tanks are, let's say it's a, a thousand gallons or so uh, typical size. It can be a little larger, a little bit smaller, and we use about two, three hundred gallons a day. That means that every drop of water that comes into the system is going to spend about what we call the residence time, about two to three days in the septic tank before it goes out to the soil treatment area. So it's going to get a lot of treatment in here. Light things like oils and, and uh, greases and soap scum, that's all going to float. Then the heavier things sink to the bottom. And so we're already doing this first stage of treatment is happening in the septic tank. So we've got this clearer effluent that's going to pass through here, move through it pretty slowly, two, three days, more settling, and then finally going out to the grain field or the soil treatment area. And then now we're going to go, uh, th this actually shows us a, a more sophisticated system that's actually going to also provide some nitrogen reduction. So this adds a component to it. This is going to add a, a filter media here. So again, we still got the septic tank, passes through here. We clean up the effluent a little bit. It's recirculated up here to an oxygen-rich environment where we can start to break down the nitrogen. And it returns into the septic tank, where again, microorganisms can help turn it into nitrogen gas and then go into the atmosphere. <gasps> is that a good thing? Bad thing? Two minutes. I got two minutes. I got to move quickly. That's good. It's a good thing. The atmosphere, the air that we breathe is 78% nitrogen. So what we're really doing is completing the nitrogen cycle and putting that nitrogen back into the atmosphere. So this is a little bit more sophisticated system. Only thing I wanted to show you here is, again, how important each component is. Your septic tank uh, and, and the uh, soil treatment area. So there's a lot of different constituents. These are the main constituents that we look at in wastewater. And just to take a look at a couple of them, like total suspended solids, this is what's coming into the septic tank. It's coming in at about 250 milligrams per liter. But by the time it's spent about two, three days in the septic tank, we've knocked that down by, by 75%. And then after it's percolated through uh, uh, three to five feet of soil, we've really reduced the contaminants by more than 90%. And we can follow the same thing through many of these other uh, contaminants biochemical oxygen demand. Here's what's coming into the septic tank. We knock that down in half. And then again, we remove more than 90% after it's percolating through that, that soil treatment area. Fecal coliform bacteria, tenfold, uh, uh, ten order, uh, order of magnitude reduction 
in the amount of uh, bacteria just passing through the septic tank, and then 99.99% removal as it uh, percolates through the soil treatment. Nitrogen, not much removal there. That's why I showed you that other system that is uh, uh, built just to take, uh, help with the nitrogen reduction. And phosphorus removal can vary from zero to 100% after it's gone through. So these are the primary uh, components uh, or contaminants that we look at wastewater and the things that we want to reduce before it returns back into the environment. So uh, just want to have a few septic system do's and don'ts. And I've always heard it's better to start with the do's rather than the don'ts. Here's some good things to do. Know where your system is located. Don't park over your system. Don't abuse your system. Pump the, pump the tank every three to five years. If you've got leaking uh, uh, faucets and toilets, fix those up. Conserve water. I know one of the mountain uh, uh, mantras is if it's brown, uh, if it's brown, flush it down. If it's yellow, let it mellow. Anybody familiar with that? I'm kind of conserving that water a little bit. You don't have to flush every time. Okay. Uh, a few more uh, do's and don'ts. Um, you have to do any work on your system. Make sure you contact the health department. We want you to build it and build it right and be once and done with it. I want to have you so we can help you fix, make sure that the fix is right. Call a professional if you have questions. Call Jefferson County Public Health if you have questions. Some don'ts. Don't park or drive on your system. They're expensive. You don't want to have to fix them up. Um, don't dig or build on top of your septic system. You might need to get access to it. You don't want to put a, a concrete block over your septic tank. How many people have never pumped their septic tank? Good, good. I'm not seeing any hands. You, that's one of the other urban myths, not urban myths, mountain myths. Oh, I haven't pumped that thing in 30 years and it's still working this block. Well, Maybe. But maybe it's because you don't have access to it. All right, anyway, just a couple of other things. Uh, on the soil treatment area, we don't want big trees growing over there, just kind of a natural vegetation. And again, uh, don't flush things down into your system that aren't going to be biodegradable. Uh, why do we maintain it? Such as septic systems, on site wastewater treatment systems are expensive. We can, uh, save money by taking care of it. The last longer, uh, you're going to protect uh, your health and the environment, and you protect the economic, the health of the economic community. Because if you do have water pollution problems that are widespread, that can knock down property values. So I can't think of one good reason not to take care of your system. It's expensive. Take care of it. Maintain it. And I just wanted to be calm. Well, I was out there on one of these uh, on-site wastewater treatment systems and. Installations over here, you can see the, the dirt pile where they're uh, digging through the soil to evaluate the soil. But I was just, it was one of those days you can still see there's some snow on the ground. So I'm thinking it was probably late spring, and one of those days where it was warm and sunny, and it's kind of getting near the end of the day, and it's calm, and there wasn't so much traffic. I just wanted to kind of end on that. So that, that's what I got for you. This is why we live in Jefferson County, it's beautiful. We've got these beautiful environments, and collaboratively, and I, and I do say that in, in the spirit of, of, uh, of uh, Mike Fahey, he, he definitely believed in collaboration and communities working together, and I do see you as ambassadors out here of water quality and, and taking care of our environment. So you can help us get the word out uh, about how important these things are. So I'll wrap it up there. That's me again. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to be up here. Give me a call. Send me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I saw that wording in his agenda and I was going to ask him about it, but I knew he had some way to turn it into this great story of how we recycle our water. Our next speaker is Dean Stanisee. Santa Stephen from the State Engineer's Office, and he will talk about the administration of water. Thanks, Peter. So, so my name is Dean Santa Stephen. I'm with the Division Engineer's Office in Greeley, Colorado. Um, my area that I see oversee is the District 23, which is the headwaters of the South Platte, down through the Denver Metro area, which is District 8 
District 2, which goes down to the Kersey line, um, also Districts 9 and 80, which is Bear Creek and Turkey Creek. So my, my area that I cover is, is this whole area that you guys are in. Um, <coughs> having, that follow, having to follow uh, the last presentation, I don't have any interesting slides or anything from like explosive diarrhea or puke, but <laughs> I'm going to try to do my best here and try to talk about water rights and water administration. I was asked to cover these topics, which was really the tributary framework of groundwater administration, well uh, permits, what, what rights do they convey, and I think a take-home point I hope everybody comes, comes out of this with is that they don't convey any rights. There's no rights associated with the well permit. Um, augmentation plans, the who, what, when, where, of, of how they are and how they work. Um, what does adjudicated mean when you're talking about wells, and what filing requirements are, are needed for a well permit? Uh, we'll start off with some water administration terms. We get pretty technical with our terms, um, and it's important to understand the difference of these. Appropriation means the application of water to a beneficial use pursuant to law. And so if you have a well permit with a water right, it may talk about a date of appropriation, which means the date that the water was first applied to a beneficial use. And that's important in our legal framework of how we administer water rights. Uh, water is administered you know, as the first in time or the first in line to use their water rights. So this date of appropriation is important. Adjudication simply means that the water court has recognized an appropriation. And, and the date of adjudication is in reference to the date the water court and the decree that confirmed that water right. So adjudication and appropriation are, are very different. Augmentation is something you may have heard of. That's you could be thought of as a replacement plan. It's a plan for increasing the supply of water for beneficial use. If you want to take water out of priority, you have to put water back in so that others aren't, aren't injured, and that's an augmentation plan. Uh, senior water rights and junior water rights, we talk about these all the time. Uh, senior water rights in Division One are water rights with appropriation dates of about 1860 to 1900. Any water right after about 1900 is considered junior. And in the administration of water, uh, we look at those appropriation dates or priority dates, and, and we distribute water to those senior water rights first. The way Colorado's water law is structured is really um, utilizes the three branches of government. The legislature makes the laws. The water court interprets the law. They determine the water rights. They, they actually adjudicate those appropriation dates. And they approve augmentation plans. And then state water officials, which includes the state engineer's office, the division engineers, and it's all encompassing is really the division of water resources. We enforce the law. We are statutorily required to issue well permits pursuant to statute. And then we administer, distribute, and regulate the water in accordance with the law. So it really involves these three branches of government. The framework of how water is administered, we, we really assume that all water in the state is tributary. And there's other kinds of water, which is water that's not tributary, which are these statutory exceptions. So if you want to think of it, all water is tributary, except for what the legislature has determined to be not tributary. And that really is talking about like the Denver Basin waters. Um, if you saw, I think in Peter's opening presentation, he had some of the Denver Basin aquifers out east, some of those unconfined and confined layers um, the legislature has determined are non-tributary to our stream system. And um, some designated basin groundwaters, um, some wells have a designation of being exempt, and exempt from administration. It doesn't mean they're not tributary just means they're exempt from administration. All other water is assumed to be tributary. And what that means is that they fall under the prior appropriation doctrine, meaning that we administer them in priority based on appropriation dates. The seniors first and then the juniors last. Um, and when we talk about water rights or prior appropriation, the basis of that is that all water is owned by the state for the people of the state of Colorado. So it's called a usufructory water right. You have a right to use the water, 
but you don't own it. The people of the state own the water. And so um, that's, that's the basic framework. Uh, I really appreciated Kip's slide and his presentation. He kind of had the same graph up, graphic up here. And he did a really good job describing you know, the tributary stream system, precip and underflow, and how they're all related. And, and they are, in fact, related. And in, from a legal perspective, we consider all of that tributary water. And tributary water is all administered the same. So your wells are administered right in line with surface water rights and reservoirs and everything else. So that's kind of the, the legal frame. This, this is a, a map of Division One, and what I think is really neat about this, this, uh, this slide is it shows the progression of water rights and, and the dates of appropriation. If you look out towards the west in the green lines, those represent the early 1860 water rights that were associated with mining. Um, they were in the mountainous areas, and right along the, the foothills, in the base of the foothills, there was a need to feed all these miners, and so we see some agricultural rights, you know, that have these 1860 priority dates as well. And then as things became developed, we started to see 1860s to 1870s along the more of the foothills are coming a little further away from the foothills, and that's designated by the blue line. And then out through Weld County, Logan County, where a lot of the, the bigger ag producers are today, they have 1880s to 1890s water rights. And so you really see this progression of water rights and dates of appropriation move from the west to the east in the state of Colorado. Uh, part of that is the contribution of return flows, water going back into